Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, really getting into Google Cloud Platform GCP. We've pulled together a whole stack of sources. Think of this as, well, a masterclass to help you navigate GCP. We're aiming to pull out the most important bits, the insights you really need to be properly informed. Yeah, no drowning in jargon today. Our mission is pretty simple. Cut through all that complexity. We want to give you clear, actionable best practices for, you know, building, securing, managing your apps on Google Cloud. So whether you're prepping for a meeting, just catching up on cloud trends, or maybe you're just really curious about GCP, we've tried to distill the critical stuff for you. Exactly. We've looked at key decisions, uh, configurations across the main areas, compute, storage, networking, security, all the big ones. We'll touch on everything from like setting up SSH keys the right way securely to picking the best database for your needs and importantly, how to keep an eye on those costs. Okay, sounds great. Let's uh, let's unpack this then. We got a fair bit to cover, so let's just jump right in. Right, first things first, laying the foundation. How do you get your team set up, connected securely? What's the Google recommended way, say, to give team members access to compute engine instances, you know, without passing private keys around? Yeah, that's. That's fundamental. You really don't want private keys floating around. The best practice here is pretty clear. Each team member, they generate their own SSH key pair, public, private. Then they add their public key to their own Google account. Simple enough. And on the admin side, you grant the compute.os admin login role, that specific IAM role, to the Google group that contains that team. It uh, completely avoids distributing sensitive private keys and leans heavily on Google's own IAM system for control. Much more secure, much more scalable. That makes a lot of sense. Centralized control via IAM, not loose keys. Okay. And sticking with security, what about audit logs? Critical for compliance, right? How do you let external auditors see what they need but without giving them, you know, the keys to the kingdom? Ah, the auditor access dilemma. It's a balancing act. You can add the auditor's Google group to specific predefined IAM roles. Think logging.viewer and bigquery.dataviewer. Logging.viewer gives read-only access to logs. BigQuery.dataViewer lets them query data, maybe billing logs you've exported there. And if you need to track really sensitive stuff, like activity in specific cloud storage buckets, who viewed what file, who changed labels, you'd use the GCP console to filter cloud logging. That used to be Stackdriver, remember? It's also uh, really important to know that the main audit logs, admin activity, data access, system events, are captured automatically at the project, folder, and organization level. So the data is there. Okay, so least privilege, again, using predefined roles, that simplifies things for auditing. Now let's talk network, foundational stuff. Say you're setting up a custom VPC, just one subnet to start. How do you make that subnet as, well, big as possible for future growth? Right, planning ahead. To get the maximum possible IP address range within a single subnet in a custom VPC, you'd use 10.0.0.08, that 8CIDR notation gives you a massive internal IP space. Over 16 million addresses, actually. Lots of room to grow. 16 million. Okay, that should cover it for a while. And what if you need to connect different VPCs? Maybe even across different companies, different Google Cloud organizations. Ah, okay, connecting separate worlds. For that, the recommended approach is VPC network peering. It basically creates a direct private connection between the two VPC networks using internal IP addresses no traffic goes over the public internet. So it's like they're on the same network almost. Pretty much, yeah, from a connectivity standpoint. It's great for shared services or connecting to partners, but, and this is crucial, you need to be really careful with firewall rules on both sides because the networks can now talk to each other directly. Security is paramount there. Right, security implications, good point. This kind of leads to policies. What if you need to enforce a rule across your whole organization? Like uh, maybe you can only deploy resources in North America, data residency, regulations, that kind of thing. Yep, very common requirement. For that, you use organization policies. You'd set up a policy right at the top level, the organization node in your resource hierarchy. And in that policy, you'd include a constraint, specifically one that restricts resource location, to block creation outside North America. Mm. It's a top-down enforcement mechanism. Okay, enforced from the top. Makes sense for governance. And just uh, generally organizing resources. As things grow, how do you group stuff that needs similar access, similar permissions? Labels. Using labels is definitely a best practice here. They're just key value pairs you attach to resources. Think environment.production or team.billing. You can then group resources by these labels, which makes it way easier to manage IAM policies, track costs, apply automation. It's flexible. Fascinating. So labels add another layer of organization on top of 
projects and folders. It really seems like Google emphasizes this granular control, but also central management mm -hmm. for both security and just keeping things tidy. Okay, so we've got our foundation laid, secure access, networks are planned, policies are in place. Now let's talk compute, where the actual work gets done. If you need a dynamic way to provision VMs, you know, with very specific configurations defined in a file, infrastructure as code, essentially, what's the Google way? Infrastructure as code on GCP, yeah. The native tool for that is Deployment Manager. It lets you define your VMs, your networks, everything in configuration files, usually YAML, it handles dependencies, ensures things are created in the right order, it's great for repeatability, consistency, and uh, it helps achieve zero downtime updates too. Deployment manager, got it, for repeatable infrastructure. Now here's a really common scenario. You've got a containerized app, maybe a Docker file, and you wanna run it on Kubernetes engine, GKE. Yeah. What's the process? Right, so first step, build that Docker image from your Docker file, Docker build. Then you need to push that image somewhere GKE can access it. That's typically container registry or the newer artifact registry. Think of it as your private Docker hub. Once the image is in the registry, you need a Kubernetes manifest, usually a YAML file, like myapp.yaml. This file tells Kubernetes what you want your image, how many copies, replicas, ports, etc. Then you just apply it to your cluster. Kubect to your apply, dash f my-app.yaml. Kubernetes takes it from there. Okay, build, push to registry, apply manifest. Seems straightforward enough. But Kubernetes itself, it can involve a lot of infrastructure management. Uh -huh. When would you choose GKE Autopilot over the standard GKE? especially if you want Kubernetes control, but less messing with the underlying machines. Ah, autopilot. It's designed exactly for that trade-off. With GKE standard, you manage the nodes, the VMs running your containers, sizing them, patching them, scaling them. Autopilot abstracts all that away. Google manages the nodes for you, automatically provisions them, scales them, patches them. You just deploy your workloads using your YAML manifests and Autopilot handles the infrastructure needed. It's great for minimizing that operational overhead. Less control over the specific nodes maybe, but much less management burden. Exactly. Yeah. You trade some node level control for operational ease. Perfect if you just want to run containers on Kubernetes without being a node admin. Makes sense. What about just plain VMs though? Let's say you have a performance monitoring app needs to scale on CPU load, but maybe company policy says no containers, no serverless, use VMs. How do you get efficient auto scaling? Right, sometimes you're constrained. The best way then is using managed instance groups or MIGs. First, you create an instance template. That's like a blueprint for your VM machine type, disk, OS image, startup scripts. Then you create a managed instance group based on that template. And within the MIG configuration, you set up auto scaling telling it to scale based on CPU utilization, maybe keeping it around 60 or 70%. The MIG then automatically adds or removes VMs based on that policy, fully automated VM scaling. So instance template plus a managed instance group with an auto scaling policy, efficient for VMs. Precisely. Okay, so how does this thinking apply to serverless then? Say, app engine, stateless containerized app needs to scale and request rate, but you also need like at least three instances always ready idle for super fast responses. How do you configure that? Ah, for App Engine, you definitely use automatic scaling. That handles the scaling based on load. But for that always ready requirement, you'd set the minute instances parameter. You'd set it to three in this case. That tells App Engine, hey, even if there's no traffic, keep three instances warm and ready to go. Guarantees that low latency when requests suddenly spike. Minital instances, okay, good parameter to know. And just comparing serverless options, when would you generally reach for cloud run versus, say, cloud functions, assuming a stateless containerized app? Good question. Cloud run is generally the go-to for serverless containers. You bring your container image, it runs it, scales it down to zero even. Very flexible. Cloud functions is more for, well, functions. Event-driven code snippets, think short-running tasks, usually triggered by something, like maybe a new message lands and pups up Google's messaging queue and you want to instantly run a quick data validation check. That's a perfect fit for cloud functions. Sub-second yeah. execution, event triggered. So cloud run for general containerized web services, cloud functions for smaller event-triggered tasks. That's a good rule of thumb, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's shift gears to data, the heart of many applications. Scenario, small amount of operational data, relational data, single geographic location, needs point in time recovery. What's the cost-effective GCP choice? For that, Cloud SQL is your friend, specifically Cloud SQL for MySQL or PostgreSQL. To meet the point in time recovery need, you just need to ensure binary logging for MySQL or its equivalent is enabled. That lets you restore to a specific second. 
And it's generally the most cost-effective managed relational database option for that kind of straightforward requirement. And high availability for Cloud SQL. Oh, simple. When you create the instance, just check the box or set the option for create failover replicas. It sets up a standby instance in a different zone automatically. Failover is handled for you. Nice and easy. But what about the other extreme? Massive data, time series data, maybe IoT, terabytes or petabytes? Known query patterns needs fast access. Okay, yeah, that's not Cloud SQL territory. For massive scale time series, especially with predictable query patterns, you're looking at Cloud Bigtable. Bigtable is a managed NoSQL wide column store. It's built for exactly this, ingesting huge amounts of data, like from millions of IoT devices, and providing really low latency reads and writes. It scales incredibly well. Big table for the big time series stuff. Got it. What about a more traditional but still large enterprise data warehouse? CFOs worried about costs wants to keep using familiar SQL tools. That screams big query. Almost always the answer for cloud data warehousing on GCP. It's serverless, fully managed, scales massively, uses standard SQL. It's optimized for those analytical queries, right one to read many patterns. Hmm. The CFO's cost concerns, the key is optimizing queries. Big query charges by data scanned. So use partition tables, especially for time-based data, and query only the partitions you need. Or use cluster tables. And a great tip, you can export your GCP build directly into a BigQuery data set. Then you can use SQL to analyze your cloud spending in detail. CFOs usually live like that. Analyze the bill with the tool you're paying for. Clever. Okay, storage now. Cloud storage. Long-term backups. Disaster recovery archives. Data you don't access often but need to keep. What storage class? For that deep archive use case, Google recommends cold line storage. It has incredibly low storage costs, like fractions of a cent per gigabyte per month. The trade-off is slightly higher retrieval costs and latency, but for data you rarely touch, it's perfect. Cold line for cold data, makes sense. How about automating moving old data there? Yep, object lifecycle management. You set rules on your storage bucket. For example, a rule with an age condition. If an object is older than 90 days, use the set storage class action to move it to cold line. You could add another rule. If an object is older than, say, 365 days, use the delete action. Automates your retention policy. Automating retention. That's powerful. One more data scenario. You've got a huge file, maybe 7 terabytes, AVRO format, sitting in cloud storage. Your data scientists only know SQL. They want to query it. Do they have to load it all into BigQuery first? No, thankfully. Mm -hmm. That would be slow and expensive. The smart way is to create an external table in BigQuery. This external table definition basically points to the AVRO file or files in your cloud storage bucket. Your data scientists can then run standard SQL queries against this external table in BigQuery as if the data was loaded, but it's actually querying the data directly in cloud storage. Wow, query data in place. That saves a ton of hassle and cost. Exactly. It's a fantastic feature for bridging cloud storage and BigQuery. Yeah, it's really clear how the best data solution depends so much on the specifics, cost, access patterns, scale, user skills. Okay, operations time. We've built it. We've stored the data. How do we keep it running well? Monitor things. Manage costs. First up, monitoring. If you have resources scattered across multiple GCP projects, how do you get a single view? Consolidated reporting. You use cloud monitoring, which mm -hmm. again used to be Stackdriver. You set up a single cloud monitoring workspace. Then you link all your different GCP projects to that one central workspace. Mm -hmm. It gives you the unified dashboard, the single place to set up alerts across your entire environment. One workspace to rule them all. And setting up alerts, like CPU on a VM hitting 90%. Yeah, pretty straightforward in that central workspace. You create an alerting policy. You define the condition metric is CPU utilization, resources your VM instance, threshold is 90%. Then you configure a notification channel, like email or pager duty, and add your contact details. Done. Simple enough. Hmm? What about predicting costs? before you deploy, like that three-tier web app on Compute Engine and Cloud SQL we mentioned? The best tool for that is the official Google Cloud Pricing Calculator. It's online, free to use. You basically spec out your entire planned architecture and the calculator number of VMs, machine types, memory disk, the Cloud SQL instance size, storage, estimated network traffic, <laughs> everything. It gives you a pretty detailed and accurate monthly cost estimate based on those inputs, essential for planning and budgeting. Right, use the calculator before swiping the credit card. Good advice. Well, finally. Now deployments. You're rolling out a new feature to your GKE cluster. It needs more memory than your current nodes have. How do you handle that smoothly? Good question. You don't want to just change the existing nodes if other things are running fine there. The clean way is to create a new node pool in your GKE cluster. Configure this new node pool with the machine type your feature needs, like N2 Hangum 16 if it's memory hungry. Then 
you configure your Kubernetes deployment for the new feature to specifically run on pods within that new high memory node pool using node selectors or affinity rules. So dedicated nodes for the demanding workload. What about scaling those nodes? Ah, yeah, you should definitely enable cluster auto scaling on that new node pool. You set minimum and maximum node counts for the pool. GKE will then automatically add or remove nodes within those limits based on the actual pod resource requests and usage in that pool. Keeps it efficient. Okay, new node pool, targeted deployment, auto scaling enabled. Got it. What about deploying risky updates, say to an app engine app? How do you minimize the chance of breaking things for all users? Canary deployments, or traffic splitting as app engine calls it. You deploy your new, potentially risky code as a completely new version alongside the existing stable version. Then, you configure traffic splitting to send only a small percentage of users, say 1%, maybe 5%, to the new version. You monitor closely. If things look good, you gradually increase the traffic percentage. If things go it's, bad, it's back. exactly, you can instantly shift 100% of the traffic back to the old stable version with basically a single click or command. It drastically reduces the blast radius of a bad deployment. Traffic splitting sounds essential for CI-CD on App Engine. It really is. One last operational thing, those long-running batch jobs. They can be interrupted, they need to be cheap. What's the go-to? Preemptible VMs in Compute Engine. That's the cost-saving play. They offer huge discounts, like up to 80% off standard VM prices. The catch is Google can re it or preempt those VMs with very short notice, like 30 seconds, if they need the capacity elsewhere. So your batch job must be fault tolerant. It needs to handle interruptions gracefully, maybe save checkpoints and be able to restart. But if it can do that, the cost savings are significant. Preemptible VMs for fault tolerant, cost sensitive batch work. Makes sense. Wow, we have covered a lot of ground today, <laughs> seriously. Uh -huh. From locking down SSH access, picking the right database for the job, all the way to optimizing app engine rollouts and squeezing costs with preemptible VMs. What's really fascinating, I think, is seeing how Google Cloud seems to have a specific tool or service for almost any scenario you can think of. But choosing the right one, the best one, mm -hmm. it's clearly not just about the tech specs. It's about really understanding your app's needs, isn't it? And cost, scale, availability, how much management you want to do. Absolutely. That's the key takeaway. There's often more than one way to do something, but the optimal way depends on those specific trade-offs. And you see that common thread, right? Google pushing managed services, pushing automation, trying to take operational load off your shoulders. Things like autopilot, cloud SQL failover, object lifecycle management. They handle the plumbing so you can focus higher up the stack. But crucially, they still usually provide the knobs and dials for granular control when you really need it. Internalizing these kinds of best practices, it really lets you build systems that are not just functional, but robust, efficient, secure, truly cloud native. So what does this all mean for you listening right now? Well, maybe consider this. As you're building your next thing on Google Cloud or even just planning it, how could applying some of these specific ideas, maybe using cold line for archives where you weren't before, or considering GKE autopilot if you're struggling with Kubernetes operations, or using external tables in BigQuery, how might that not just optimize that one project, but maybe fundamentally shift how your whole team, your whole organization thinks about building and managing things in the cloud? What assumptions about infrastructure might you be able to challenge now? That's a great question to end on. Food for thought. Okay, that's all for this deep dive into Google Cloud Platform best practices. We really hope you feel more informed, maybe a bit more confident, tackling your next cloud challenge. Until next time.